Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Brett Fairbairn. I'm the Provost and Vice President Academic at the University of Saskatchewan. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the University of Saskatchewan World Water Week Lecture Series, co-presented with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Um, you know, I'd begin by saying that water is a topic that's never far from the mind of any person in the province of Saskatchewan. In winter, uh, we shovel it, we risk getting stuck in it. People in Saskatchewan can walk on water at least for a few months a year. In summer, we usually are short of it. Um, but of course, most of all in spring, we never know whether it's going to be solid or liquid or whether we need to look ahead to fl floods or drought. But water is a concern not only in Saskatchewan. Um, I, I think awareness of the importance of water is uh, part of our sense of place in um, a continental climate in the Canadian prairies. And that's part of our sense of place that we as a university take with us in the research we do in other parts of the world. Today is United Nations World Water Day. And here at the University of Saskatchewan, water does indeed mean the world to us. There's a lot going on in water research at the University of Saskatchewan, and so much so that the university has designated this entire week as Water Week, with events going on every day. The expertise and the facilities for water research on this campus are unparalleled in Canada, and we believe them to be among the best in the world. Water security is a signature research area of the University of Saskatchewan. And that's perhaps best reflected in the university's recent appointment of Dr. Howard Wheater as the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Water Security. There are only 19 Canada Excellence Research Chairs in the country. And that uh, CERC, the Canada Excellence Research Chair, is the largest investment our university has ever made in any research chair in our history. It's also one of the single lar largest water research investments in the world today. The work of that new Canada Excellence Research Chair is going to build on the work of more than 70 faculty researchers across this campus who conduct leading research in relation to water. That includes five Canada Research Chairs as well as an NSERC Industrial Research Chair. I would also say that this week marks the official launch of the Global Institute for Water Security, which just last week was formally approved by the University of Saskatchewan Council as a research center. This new institute, led by Dr. Wheater, represents a $30 million joint commitment by the Government of Canada, the Government of Saskatchewan, and the University of Saskatchewan and our friends and partners. So in honor of World Water Day and the launch of the Global Institute of Water Security, Dr. Wheater will give us a presentation that will be entitled Water Security and the Perfect Storm. Before you come up, Howard, though, I do have to say a word about you. Dr. Wheater obtained a first-class degree in engineering science from the University of Cambridge. Um, as an aside, as a graduate of another place in England, it pains me to say that Cambridge is the leading place for the kind of research that he's done. And he worked for Rolls-Royce uh, Rolls as a fluid mechanics specialist before undertaking a PhD in hydrology at Bristol University and joining the staff of Imperial College, where he was head of environmental and water resource engineering and the first director of the Imperial College Environmental Forum. In October of 2010, Dr. Wheater moved to the University of Saskatchewan to take up his appointment as our Canada Excellence Research Chair in Water Security. Dr. Wheater's research interests are in hydrology and water resources, including climate change, surface and groundwater hydrology, floods, water resources, water quality, and waste management. He's published some 200 refereed papers and six books. Academic awards include prizes from the UK Institution of Civil Engineers and the British Hydrological Society, as well as the 2006 Prince Sultan bin Abdulaziz International Prize for Water. Uh, it's a remarkable resume, a leading researcher in the globe on water topics. It's our treat today to hear from Dr. Weeder. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Well, um, thank you so much, Brett, for those warm words of welcome. And um, I think this is an important day for, uh, for World Water. It's also an important day for me, um, having arrived in Canada 
um, with a lot to learn on the, on the 1st of October, um, and uh, just having experienced the, the sense of the beginning of spring here and the end of my first uh, Canadian winter. So I've um, had a great time. I've been incredibly impressed by the warmth of welcome I've had from colleagues across the university, across the province, and indeed across Canada. Um, and uh, I think we're making some exciting progress in putting forward a program to address some key issues in water security. So what I'd like to do today is to um, spend a, a few minutes talking to you about the significance of, of water around the world, the global issues, and then I'll come closer to home and tell you what, uh, what I've been learning about since uh, I arrived in October. Uh, and then finally, I'll conclude with some comments about uh, our current plans and progress as we move towards implementing my CERC program and in particular the new Global Institute for Water Security. So there are many things to say about water, but uh, it has, as, as, as Brett so nicely put, um, many meanings for, for, for us um, and many meanings for different people around the world. And this is a slide of a lady in Bangladesh and if you ask her what was water security means for her, well, it means access to safe drinking water, which is a major issue for uh, almost a billion of the world's population right now. Um, and not, um, uh, not forgetting uh, those of us in, in rural Canada who also have issues of access to clean drinking water. You'll see also that there are issues of floods, one of the world's most damaging natural hazards, a particular issue for Bangladesh. Um, and there's a hidden story in this picture, and uh, I'm not sure whether Ingrid Pickering is uh, with us today, but um, uh, when groundwater was developed in, uh, in Bangladesh to meet increasing need, it wasn't discovered until some time after the development that it was very high in arsenic and people were getting seriously sick. So we have one of the world's most advanced analytical tools here for geochemistry, the Canadian Light Source, and Ingrid's been working with that um, to address some of these problems of arsenic pollution in Bangladesh. And there's a film for those of you that uh, can come on Friday lunchtime about that story. So um, I think different people will de define water security in different ways at different times and in different contexts. Um, but a, a simple definition is that we're really concerned about um, sustainable use of water. And we're concerned about protecting water resources. And we're also concerned about the major hazards that uh, we face as society in terms of floods and droughts. I have to start off a talk on water by really reminding us what we already know, I think, but that water is many faceted and has different values and different roles in society. And of course, the most basic is drinking water. And none of us can survive for more than a day or two without clean drinking water. If we lacked access, access to clean drinking water, uh, that would be the most precious thing in the world to us at that time. <clears throat> we also need water for food. And some of you were well aware of this, others perhaps not, that three quarters of the world's consumptive use of water actually grows to, goes to growing crops to, feel the, feed, to um, feed the world's population. And that's a statistic that carries right through to the South Saskatchewan River, where more than 80% of the water consumed in the South Saskatchewan is used for irrigation. So there's talk about the water agriculture, water food nexus. There's also talk about the water energy nexus. Um, I don't need to tell Canadians that hydropower is um, a tremendous uh, uh, asset. Uh, it's uh, a relatively benign source of uh, energy, um, and uh, it's a major economic asset to many parts of Canada. Of course, water plays another role in power generation. If you talk to the French government about their concerns for water and power, they would say what we're really worried about is drought and the lack of cooling water in our river systems. So one side of the energy nexus is to do with uh, generating energy, but the other side is consuming energy. Water is heavy, moving it around is expensive. Um, if you went down to Arizona, and every time I go to Arizona, the plane is full of Canadians escaping to Arizona. Um, down in Arizona, you'll find that the biggest 
consumptive use of electricity is in pumping water from the Colorado River for water supply. And, and just our basic needs for treating drinking water and managing wastewater are very energy consumptive. So there's a whole story there about the link between water and energy um, in the context of uh, a changing climate and a need for adaptation and mitigation measures. Water for industry is essential. It means different things in different places. Um, so for us, it might, um, we might think about, is there enough water to um, develop some new mines? Uh, what about the water for the oil sands in Alberta? What about the water for potential oil sands development in the province? Um, of course, rather low down on this list is, is environment. And um, the water uh, is essential for the environment. Water determines the environment that we know and love. Um, I tend to sense that in North America, environment is pretty low down the list in terms of priorities. And that's interesting me, to me coming from Europe, because in Europe a few years ago we had some very radical legislation, something called the Water Framework Directive. And the single most important management objective for water managers in Europe now is protecting environmental quality. So the Europeans took a very bold step and put the environment right at the top of their water management agenda. So those are a set of issues around water supply, um, as I already mentioned, floods uh, are one of the world's most damaging natural hazards. So that's the context in which water is so essential for us in society. Um, what are some of the issues? Well, I've touched upon the fact that a large number of people simply don't have access to what is now considered to be a basic human right, access to clean drinking water. Um, many people around the world live in areas which are short of water, so-called water-stressed areas. But the biggest problem that I see pretty much everywhere I go is that we have all grown up in an era of uncontrolled use of water. And we've got, absolutely got to the point where that has become evidently um, unsustainable. So if you look around the world, you'll find rivers are drying up, wetlands are dry, groundwater levels are declining. Um, there's a, a whole set of, um, of graphic examples that you might think of, starting with perhaps the Aral Sea. Maybe I'll take you to the north of Jordan, to um, a wetland, a be very beautiful wetland called the Azarak Oasis, um, a Ramsar site because of its importance as a habitat for overwintering birds. Due to overexploitation, it's bone dry, and what's more, the people that live there, having enjoyed such a beautiful environment, now, if they're lucky, get water two days out of seven in the week. So, an anecdote, but one of very, very many that one could draw on from all around the world. Water quality uh, is also something that we can't forget. Um, in some of the world's biggest developing economies, uh, water quality is a huge problem, particularly China. Um, uh, we're not free from water quality problems in Canada, and some of them are simple and basic. Um, perhaps to do with uh, the, the nutrients that we have in our river systems. Um, and others are much more subtle. For example, what is the effect of oil sands development in a rather complex river system which already has uh, natural oil sands and, and natural discharges from those oil sands occurring. So there's a whole set of issues which are challenging, but if that wasn't sufficiently challenging, when we look to the future, we see um, many more challenges ahead. So the first thing to say is that we will see um, increased demand because there will be more people. That's unstoppable. Um, people expect economic development, and we tend to use more water um, as we become wealthier. Uh, we need to feed the world, uh, so we need that water for agriculture. Uh, we need energy for those people. So demand um, will increase the pressure on our resources. But also our resources are changing. Um, so they're changing in different ways. An obvious way, perhaps, is the changing environment around us, changing land use and changing land management. So uh, the prairies would have been a very different place 100 years ago. We've had very large scale development of agriculture. We've had very large scale development of urban areas. And of course, around the world, the whole world is concentrating on megacities. Um, 
taking natural environments and turning them into concrete landscapes. That's a big environmental change, one that we know quite well how to manage. We're not at all sure how well to manage the more subtle changes about rural land management and its impacts. And then the big unknown is climate change. Um, it's undoubt undoubted that we're living in a world which is getting warmer and we have expectations that that is going to change our water systems. But more than that, it'll change our terrestrial ecosystems, our aquatic ecosystems, and it'll change the way in which we perceive and use and value water. And if we look to the IPCC in terms of water futures, then we talked about water in people living in water scarce areas, the numbers potentially are very large by the time we get out to the mid 21st century. So that series of issues is a big set of problems for us to manage our way through. And the phrase water futures in the perfect storm, the perfect storm was coined by a friend of mine, John Beddington, who's the UK government's chief scientist, uh, to express his concern about looking to this future of increasing stresses on water and food and energy. What are the implications of this? Well, first of all, we have absolutely got to the limit of the way in which we currently manage our water. Um, we cannot continue to increase demand. And that means that we have to start making some hard choices. Um, and that really takes us immediately into the topic that uh, Alan Casey so elegantly spoke about yesterday, about the role of um, governance in water. So these issues of sustainability will involve using water, water more wisely, but also making decisions between uses of water. And that might mean decisions between sectors of an economy, for example, water for agriculture versus water for hydropower or water for mining. Or perhaps more interestingly, should we say, um, potential conflicts between upstream and downstream users. And um, we all sit in a river system where we know that 75% of our water comes from Alberta and the Rocky Mountains. So clearly our relationships between the prairie provinces are crucial to the efficient management of water. Um, in many places around the world, there are quite severe stresses where water resources fall across international boundaries. Um, and there are some real concerns about how the world can manage its way through those issues. And the only thing that's certain about the future is that it's uncertain. Um, and that's something that we have to recognize and take on board in the way in which we look to, to managing the future. Um, so we have to look at, uh, at, uh, at new ideas um, about the way we might want to invest in protecting against increased risks or increased climate variability. Uh, and we have to have techniques that are robust in the face of uncertainty, which we can adapt as we become more clear about what the future holds. It's interesting that um, as we move from one IPCC assessment to the most recent one, the uncertainty levels that were formerly recognized actually increased. So as we know more, we can recognize that we know less. And um, we've talked uh, somewhat about the, the science challenges, the technical challenges, but really the societal challenges are very considerable. How do we put together a set of policies that will allow us to manage both our water and our land and our air in the context of providing water services, food, and energy services, and meeting the challenges of a changing climate and the needs for climate mitigation. So for all these reasons, water is becoming more and more um, uh, a maker of headline news. And uh, I'm sure you can um, all think of, of very recent examples. And of course, currently the press here is full of um, justifiable concerns for spring flooding. Uh, it was only a couple of months ago that there were these terrible images of flooding in Australia um, that were making news. But I'm going to go back in to my uh, personal journey into Canada, um, which uh, started as I flew in from the States in September um, of last year, and I bought the New York Times, and I found the New York Times was pretty much full of water stories. And uh, I'll just mention a couple, because they're um, in in instructive. So the first takes us to Egypt and the Nile. Um, the Nile is one of the world's great rivers. Um, Britain has a 
slightly dubious past in the Nile, and in the 1950s gave most of the water rights to Egypt and uh, a small allocation to Sudan. But in fact, of course, most of the water comes from um, Ethiopia and the rest comes from many other upstream countries going up to Lake Victoria. So perhaps not unsurprisingly, perhaps not unreasonably, those upstream countries have got to the point where they would like to renegotiate the Nile Waters Agreement from the 1950s. Um, and this is Egypt's reaction. In fact, a friend of mine was Minister of Water for Egypt until recently, um, and he went up to uh, Khartoum to a water meeting, and he was insufficiently critical of Ethiopian water plans, and when he came back to Cairo, he was fired. Um, so what, the, what does the Egyptian press say about this? Um, violating Egypt's quota of Nile water as a genocidal war against 80 million people. Not bad as an opening gambit for a debate about water use. <laughs> so water is a very hot topic around the world, and, um, uh, and really uh, water scientists have a major responsibility to try and help the international community manage its way through some of these difficult issues. The other story um, that took the headlines in that paper, and it's perhaps um, salutary to think how quickly the memory of these big stories lasts, but this is the Pakistan floods. So um, the floods were hitting in July and August of last year. It was a huge crisis. 20 million people were affected. 12, need, 12 million people were in need of, of desperate, urgent humanitarian existence, uh, assistance. And this was billed as uh, possibly um, one of the worst disasters, if not the worst disaster in the history of Pakistan. Now, um, there's a very interesting uh, rider to that story. And um, uh, of course, if those of you that have been aware of the news are aware of other things going on in 2010 and indeed this year, but the, another big story from 2010 was this one. And those of you with an interest in wheat prices will be all too familiar with the fact that um, the wheat crop was devastated and the Soviet Union, uh, former Soviet Union, was affected by temperatures which were said to be the hottest in a thousand years. Now the interesting thing is that that event, the Russian heat wave, was actually teleconnected to the Pakistan floods. So if you look at the upper, air, upper atmosphere circulation patterns, you would have seen that um, a blocking high pressure zone over Moscow gave rise to that incredible heat, but also it perturbed the Indian monsoon system, and that's what gave Pakistan its um, major floods. So we live very much in a global world, and we are connected by global climate, and we really have to understand those interactions. Coming rather closer to home, um, this is um, an interesting picture, and it represents the summer rainfall in Saskatoon, very close to here, uh, and a rain gauge at the SRC. Um, and um, you can see perhaps that the record begins in 1900, and that the wettest summer uh, until recently was in 1923, where they had 420 millimetres of precipitation in the summer. And how about this year? 2010, um, more than 600 millimetres, 640 millimetres of precipitation. So we certainly had our record, and um, uh, the farmers in the province lived with the consequences last year, um, and we expect to live with the consequences in the spring as we have our snow melt on a very, very wet landscape. So all these extremes takes us back to the intriguing question of climate change and are these extremes um, actually a symptom of a changing climate. We certainly expect more extremes under a warmer world. Unfortunately our science isn't good enough and our data is not good enough to allow us to say whether these extremes really are symptomatic of climate change. Extremes are rare we're thinking about events that might happen every 100 years or every 1,000 years, and we simply don't have the long records to see how the tales of those distributions are changing. And nor do we really have sufficient confidence in our climate models to be able to attribute changes to precipitation, although we can do better with temperature. So perhaps the best that we can say about 2010 was it was a very interesting and remarkable year for extremes, and Perhaps this is indeed the writing on the wall as we look forward to a warmer climate. 
So a set of introductory remarks about um, water and its importance and its challenges. And I'd like now to move on to say a little bit about what I've learned um, in the five months or so since I've been here with the help of a lot of very good friends, many of whom are in the audience, who've been patiently educating me and taking me around the province to see, um, to see how things work. So what do we know about the provincial challenges? Well, the big issue, of course, is that we all depend uh, on the South Saskatchewan River. Um, so 75% of the river water comes from the Rocky Mountains. And we live in a very interesting prairie landscape which is very difficult for hydrologists to understand and model, where a very large proportion of the area does not normally connect to the river system. Uh, I say does not normally because under extreme conditions we can see much greater connectivity. So we have this um, straightaway issue of a major resource being essentially a transboundary resource between three uh, provinces and that raises uh, potential issues of sharing of water um, between the provinces and, of course, between different users. Um, it's also worth noting that um, the major consumptive use of water is for irrigation, and that is in the South Saskatchewan River, and that is mainly in um, southern Alberta. Now, if we look to southern Alberta, what we find is that we have um, run out of water. So there is no new licensed water available in southern Alberta. So that's a major challenge. And there's some very interesting developments taking place at the moment in private water markets as um, farmers not only use more, to, more water more efficiently but consider more seriously the risks of, um, uh, of their crops and the extent to which they might need water and which the extent to which they might be able to make water available to their neighbours perhaps with greater value crops. So there's a very interesting set of issues emerging there in terms of water use and management. There are problems of pollution, um, and these are, are, are many, but clearly we and all society is used to emptying its wastes into the nearby river, and we continue to do that with our cities and also with our agricultural land. So there are challenges around water quality. And then Perhaps one of the most difficult challenges to foresee is really the climate change and land management, both of which are changing the landscape. And we don't really understand very clearly um, what the impacts of that are in terms of flood and drought resilience, in terms of, of the future of our agriculture and our ecosystems. And one thing that I've really learnt <laughs> since I came to Canada is that water governance in the Prairie Provinces is complicated. Um, so we have strong uh, mandates for provincial powers over some aspects of the water cycle, but of course they're all different in different provinces. Um, we have some federal uh, governance in certain areas like fisheries, and we have this loose confederation across the Prairie Provinces trying to manage this complex system. So we also have First Nations interests. <coughs> Um, so water governance is certainly complicated and there's some very interesting issues as to how that, the, the current systems which work quite well at an at a, uh, effective level, um, very much based on good personal relationships, but if we actually had a major series of, let's say, three dry years uh, and um, the pressures re really begin to build, then there's some interesting issues as to how robust these governance structures might be under those stresses. Um, most of you that live here, I think, are aware that the climate around us is changing and there's pretty clear evidence as you look to the Rockies of the uh, way in which that's happening when you think about um, uh, some of the glaciers. So this is a slide that Chris De Beer produced, some of his work on looking at glacier retreat in the Rockies. Um, we, we don't have enough information about the Rockies despite the fact that so much water comes from there, but we do have some very dedicated scientists like John Pomeroy, who's spent um, a lot of effort working in a few sites in the Rocky Mountains, trying to unscramble the complexity of um, the snow processes uh, and the melt processes and their interaction with vegetation and what might be happening as climate changes. So um, 
I think John is not with us today. I think he's flying in this afternoon. But um, he will tell us that if you look at his experimental sites, they are considerably warmer than they used to be and that there are changing patterns of snow melt, uh, changing patterns of snow accumulation and snow melt, a decline in flows, although around a very marked interannual variability. If we come downstream and think about the uh, border between Alberta and Saskatchewan, the blue, picture, blue dots there represent so-called natural flows, and the red, what we're actually getting given the uses that are being made of the water. And I think a couple of things to take away from that picture. First of all, very large variability between years, um, a slow declining trend, so there certainly isn't more water, there's less. And then when we look at the red dots, we see some really very low flows under drought years. So there's high variability, some low flow conditions, and an overall declining trend of water availability. I haven't been here long enough to remember this. Many of you will have, but um, we talked about this summer and how wet it's been. Um, one of the interesting hist historical aspects of the prairies is how much um, climate variability has affected them in terms of their development and management. And the drought of 1999-2000 was said by some to be the most expensive natural disaster in Canadian history. And if you look at the list of top 20 disasters, they're dominated by prairie events, by extremes, by, mostly by droughts and some by flood. So the prairies is a very interesting environment, and I'm very struck by how successful agriculture has been in adapting its management practices to cope with this variability. But we need to look forward to increased variability and the challenges and meet the challenges of that. So when we think about water quantity, we see that the Rocky Mountain water is essential for all of us to survive in our urban centres on the prairies. Uh, and yet there's change taking place. We expect uh, less snow and a changing pattern of snow melt and hence a changing pattern of river flows. Uh, we're losing the snow, we're losing the cold content which has been our natural storage. We're seeing some shifts from snow to precipitation, liquid precipitation, rainfall. Um, but at the same time, warmer climates will give us more evaporation. So looking at futures over the prairies is really quite uncertain. We've talked about the vulnerability to floods and droughts, and I'm sure we're about to see some very significant flooding in the spring. Um, these are the effects that we expect to increase in a warmer world. So managing our way through these issues um, is really a challenge. It's a challenge to develop the science, to develop the management tools, and to get our political governance structures in place so we can actually make some quite hard decisions about water futures. So I've talked a lot about water quantity, but I'll say a little bit too about water quality. Um, I'm, I suspect everybody in this room is aware of uh, the problems of water quality in Lake Winnipeg. It's just emblematic. Um, in 2007, there was a, an algal bloom which covered 15,000 square kilometers of the lake, an absolutely vast area. Um, and this is all to do with um, a complex pattern of land management change and nutrients from our urban sources and our agricultural sources finding their way through our major river systems. So this is an, a critically important issue for the Prairie Provinces. Um, what can we say about uh, what's happening closer to home? Well, Chris De Beer very kindly put together some data for me um, so that we can begin to look at the um, so South Saskatchewan River system, and let me just remind you, we've got the Red Deer River here, uh, and the Bow River here, and the Old Man River here, and then we're, we've got the Saskatchewan and Lake Diefenbaker and Saskatoon. So <clears throat> this is a slide that is much too busy to read, but the important thing is that we've got um, phosphorus levels from um, 30 years of data. We have uh, the Old Man River, the Bow River and the Red Deer River joining to form the Saskatchewan and Diefenbaker. And of course the blue is the trace of observed total phosphorus. And the red is interesting because um, the red has been set by Alberta as their 
uh, quality guideline for phosphorus. So you can immediately see how the very pristine water of the Rocky Mountains rapidly becomes very heavily loaded with phosphorus uh, and how large those levels are in comparison with what is considered to be um, an environmentally acceptable flow. So there's some very important issues for us because all of this phosphorus is finding its way downstream and into Diefenbaker, and we really need to understand more about the potential risks that could arise from that. So a few things to say about water quality and local issues. Clearly nutrients are a big issue. They're a big issue everywhere. I've come from the UK. The single biggest source of pollutant of concern is nutrients in um, most of the w developed world. Um, there are other issues of concern. We have some great expertise on campus with people that have some of the world's most sophisticated analytical equipment. With that, we can start to look at some of the exotic chemicals. These might be pharmaceutical products that we use and flush down the toilet. Um, they might be other chemicals, but we now have the ability to observe those, and there are concerns about what these chemicals might do both to the natural environment the health of fish, and perhaps to us as we reuse that water downstream. Um, I've just come from a very stimulating meeting with young scientists um, talking about uh, a whole range of water issues, um, and I learned a new statistic today. So 57% um, of private wells in Saskatchewan um, have drinking water that fails at least one health criterion. So groundwater quality is often poor, it's not very well understood, and it's a major issue for rural populations. Um, a story that I was aware of just a couple of weeks ago, um, and that is that um, there is significant transboundary concern about uh, air pollution from the oil sands industry up in the northwest in, in Alberta, drifting over to Saskatchewan and and then concerns about what uh, effects that might be having on the, uh, the, the lake waters um, in that system, which are rather poorly buffered. So we're not short of problems. Um, we might be short of data, and we might be short of um, bodies, um, but there are plenty of problems for us to be concerned about, and I think we need to, as a society, be prepared to invest just a little bit more in trying to understand and manage our way through these very complex environmental problems. I'm starting to have some involvement with um, the oil sands, uh, which is a very interesting story, um, a geopolitical story around natural resource development. Um, and clearly the oil sands, uh, for those of you that have been involved, and some in this room have been very intimately involved, um, is an industry that has been uh, really receiving um, a very high amount of adverse publicity uh, right up till this week for various reasons. Um, but um, the big set of events were in December when uh, the Royal Society of Canada produced a report um, and also a, a government, a federal government team reviewed the quality of monitoring and the oil sands and both were very, very critical. Um, and this then raises a, a challenge to both the industry and the provincial government and also the federal government um, to manage its way through a very complex set of science issues. Clearly, the oil sands are one of the world's globally significant um, sources of energy, huge strategic and economic importance, particularly as we speak at the moment. Clearly, they're very controversial with respect to environmental impacts, and partly that's to do with the way in which they use energy, but um, more particularly, there's a lot of concern about potential impacts on terrestrial and aquatic systems. Uh, and as already mentioned, there's huge international scrutiny. Um, so the oil sands industries in Alberta are not really facing a target so much of people in Alberta, but people in North America or the rest of the world and their concerns about environmental management. So the upshot from that is that really there is a need to do truly world-class science, both to evaluate current impacts and also to evaluate and manage future risks. And um, one of my little jobs that I've picked up while I've been here is to sit on the Alberta's Provincial Environmental Monitoring Panel, which is charged with producing a way forward 
to how do you achieve world-class science in monitoring and evaluation. So it's a very um, big challenge, but a very important task. <coughs> um, what I found when I arrived here is that really there's some great work going on. Um, so um, colleagues in geological sciences and civil and geological engineering uh, are doing first-class work um, looking at very large-scale experimental observations to understand how reclamation works in the field. And in the toxicology lab, we've got some really smart techniques for um, looking at the way in which these very complex chemicals that are being discharged in, um, into the local environment from the oil sands might or might not affect um, aquatic life. So there's some very good work being done, um, but it, uh, there's a need for it to be harnessed more effectively to address these very complex issues. Okay. So I started off by giving you a global picture, and I've now come back to the prairies, and um, I'm now going to come back to the university here and just say a little bit about what we're doing and why I'm here and where we're going. So the first thing to say is that um, we were very fortunate to receive an award from the federal government of a Canada Excellence Research Chair, and that meant that I arrived in Canada. Why did I come? Well... Um, for several reasons. Um, first of all, this is, as Brett mentioned, one of the, um, the greatest opportunities for a research scientist in water anywhere around the world at the moment. But more particularly, um, it was because of what I found here when I first started visiting in terms of the range of expertise and the depth of expertise and the fact that there are so many world-class people here ready and willing to work with me. So that's been tremendous and I've really been looking forward um, and very much enjoying um, starting to build programs within the university. Now we have some challenges because we, we have a funded program and um, that's um, something that uh, we are working to, to, to fulfill and carry out. But also the water agenda is so much more than our funded program. And so we've been thinking about um, ways to, uh, to manage our way forward with these challenges. And hence we've had this very exciting development of a new global institute, which, as Brett said, was formally approved on the 17th of March last week. So the global institute will be um, a flagship for us. It'll be our umbrella. It'll allow us... Um, a mechanism for bringing people together across the university and working closely with our partners, particularly Environment Canada, uh, but also Ag Canada, SRC, and so on, to really um, capitalize on the strengths here and focus them on some of these grand challenge problems. Let me tell you a little bit, very briefly, um, about the CERC program <clears throat> and what we're working on. Firstly, climate change and water security. These are global issues, but they have local importance. For us, we're looking at the Saskatchewan River Basin. The second issue is to do with how land and water management is inextricably linked and what it does to environmental quality. And here we're looking at the South Saskatchewan River. And then finally, we're looking at sustainable development of natural resources, and we're thinking about the oil sands issues that I just mentioned. So one of the surprises to me um, when I arrived here was to find out um, actually what's going on and how much world-class expertise and capability there is around the place. So as we start to build our research programs, then first of all, um, we're concerned with building modeling tools so that we can explore futures for water resources and water quality. But that modelling has to be underpinned by good science, and that good science has to be been based on observation and monitoring and analysis. And so we're really looking at um, where we might do that. And what we found are great strengths. I already mentioned Marmot Creek. Um, we need more observations in the Rocky Mountains. We hope to achieve that. Um, the boreal forest is a very interesting area, particularly if we think about climate change and the, the transition of the ecosystems between the forest sites and the prairie. Uh, what are the controls on those transitions? What are the tipping points? How might they respond to a warmer climate? And um, we've had, there's a project led by Environment Canada 
with many other partners, currently called Berms. It originally was called Boreas. Um, and it's a very well-recognized international program of experimental work. It's been running since the 1990s, looking at carbon and energy and water fluxes above the boreal forest. Similarly, something else, a little nugget that I discovered, Keniston, um, down to the south there. So Keniston is actually running as an international experiment co-funded by Environment Canada, the Canadian Space Agency, and NASA, looking at remote sensing tools and their ability to um, monitor soil moisture. And then we have, um, for many of you will be familiar perhaps of St. Denis. St. Denis is a wonderful area just outside town where many, many um, good academics from the university have worked individually over many years to look at different aspects of hydrology and soils and geochemistry and groundwater. Um, but they actually haven't really worked together yet. And so we're, we're um, developing a program for the first time to integrate all this work um, to try and understand better and develop new modeling tools for these very complex prairie landscapes. And then finally on this diagram, um, Smith Creek uh, down here is uh, a research site that Cherry Westbrook and others have been looking at, which is one of those prairie sites that's been quite controversially affected by drainage. And we need to understand the effects of that drainage um, with that as an exemplar system. So we've got all these great building blocks um, that we're using to construct um, a major program to address those themes. So theme A, we want to improve tools so we can get better handle on future climate. We need to understand the functioning of the mountain systems, the boreal forest and the prairie systems better. We want to pull disciplines together so we can link with the geochemistry and the ecology in those systems um, to put the water together with the chemistry and the biology. Um, and then all of that has to be represented in modeling tools that people can usefully work with to help address some of the really difficult issues of how do we manage water futures in the province. Um, our water quality theme, we're focusing heavily on nutrients and Diefenbaker. Uh, we were looking to a partnership with Alberta Environment and Agriculture on agricultural nutrients. Um, we're looking for partnerships with the Saskatchewan Watershed Authority and the, and the province in general, um, trying to understand better um, the, work, the, the behavior of Lake Diefenbaker, building on some very important work that John Giese did a few years ago, building a, um, a, a new and expanded team to focus on that. Um, again, our tool is to understand these problems to allow us to predict the future and hence um, improve our management. Um, as already mentioned, we're interested in exotic chemicals and we expect to do some observations in and around Saskatoon, in and around Diefenbaker and other places to understand the potential role of these in the aquatic system and impacts on human health. And we certainly need to know much more about groundwater um, its recharge, its quality, and its impacts on people's health. Um, okay. So we've got a big research agenda, um, and that's focused on those three areas. And um, I'm very pleased to say that um, a large number of people across the university have been working with me to develop these ideas and to put them into practice. And we now are purchasing equipment, and students are... Um, going out and we are starting to make observations, um, including, I have to say, um, some detailed observations of the spring snowmelt so that we can capture this, um, what we expect to be a very interesting event. So that takes me finally to um, the Global Institute for Water Security. So the Global Institute was approved last week and today is our formal launch of that institute. Um, we aim to use it to um, create uh, an evident world-leading center of excellence. We think we have huge critical mass and capability here. Um, one of the keys is providing um, a, a means by which people can work together. Um, so we have an administrative structure that allows to do that. Um, and not just within the university, but working closely with Environment Canada and our other provincial and federal partners. And we have ambitions to go beyond the 
narrow scope of the funded CERT program. Because as I've been hinting, um, some of the major issues in water lie on the edges of that agenda, and in particular, issues to do with policy and governance and social science. And there are many other issues, for example, water and health, which also resonate um, with local need and also interests within the university community here. Um, it's perhaps just reinforcing the social dimension, because I've spent so much talking about science and engineering. Um, we, as people, um, have our own individual responsibilities, and this picks up the theme very nicely from yesterday's lecture from Anne and Casey. Um, so what people do um, provides a driver for environmental change. What people do um, in response to environmental change uh, affects the way in which policy is created. And of course, what we do collectively changes our environmental futures. And you just have to think about how the prairies have changed over the last century to see that and how the city is and continues to develop to see that. So there's a very important role for social science um, because we have to get better insight into those issues, um, both economic and societal and institutional and policy issues, um, so that we can really put the science and the social science together to understand what is actually a very complex social and environmental system. So one of our ambitions in the Global Institute is to create a new paradigm in bringing together social science and the natural sciences and engineering to address what is indeed a coupled system. So, um, whoops. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, um, these are some of the techniques that are being used um, in, in other places, and we're, we're fortunate to have attracted uh, Professor Pat Gober, who is joining us from um, Arizona, who works with stakeholders, and, and this is one of the fancy tools that she has to play with down in Arizona um, for working with stakeholders in visualization theater. So there's some very interesting challenges in the social science area, but also some interesting opportunities and potential for new developments in the future here. So um, I've been very busy, and uh, I've enjoyed my time here over the last five months immensely. Um, I do have a habit of picking up other jobs, and um, I thought I'd just mention some of the things I'm doing because I think they're important, because when I go, I take the university's name with me, and I take the institute's name with me, and, um, and I think the university and the institute is working on some very important societal problems. So one interesting um, job that I've recently started is that I've joined a court of arbitration um, in a dispute between Pakistan and India over the Indus Water Treaty. So the Pakistanis are very concerned about um, a dam which is being constructed by India uh, on the upper headwaters of the Indus in, um, uh, uh, um, in, in Kashmir. Um, so one of the world's hotspots. Um, I've also been given a very interesting job, which I'm very pleased to do. Um, so the Council of Canadian Academies has, has has been asked to look into the future of water research for agriculture in Canada. Um, and that's something which I'll be chairing, which will be kicking off this summer. So I think that's something that will reinforce Saskatchewan's role at the heart of agriculture and Canadian agriculture and give us some very important opportunities to help take the research agenda forward um, as we think about the nexus between water and agriculture. And then finally, as I already mentioned, I think um, the Alberta uh, oil sands issue is um, very controversial, um, and what it certainly needs is a new approach and a fresh start to develop a world-class monitoring and evaluation system. And that's something that the Alberta government has said it is committed to, and uh, one of my roles is to help them achieve that. So the science um, is interesting, um, and the social science is interesting, um, and then we have some very big real-world problems um, to, uh, to work our way through, and I'm very pleased to um, be part of those. So just to conclude, um, I hope I've demonstrated that water is an issue which affects all of us and that there's some real challenges. Those challenges are complicated. 
They involve science and engineering and social science and governance. So certainly we need new science technologies and tools and our aim and ambition is to provide those. But we need to make sure that information is useful and usable by the people that need actually to make the hard decisions about water futures. And our goal is to do that here um, for Canada and Western Canada in particular, but also to have worldwide outreach and impact. Thank you very much indeed. Thank <laughs> you.